Song of Solomon. There will be no visuals today. <laughs> Just want you to know that, okay? Um, some of you might be going, I don't know a whole lot about the Song of Solomon. And, and you know the truth is, is that uh, a lot of people don't. A lot of people just know that they're kind of confused. They look at one Bible and they see something that says Song of Songs. And then they look at another Bible and they say Song of Solomon. And they go, is this the same book? It is, just to settle that here, okay? Um, I want you to know I read this, I read this uh, several times this week. Uh, this book probably is spoken about more in foreign countries than any other book in the Bible. In America, no one speaks about it because we don't know about the classiness of love. We know about the garbage of love. We know the playboy version of love. We know the playboy version of, of uh, pornography. And, and, and so we, we struggle with reading something like this. And the truth is, is that it is an incredible book. It's got, it's got tender words. It's got compliments of one another. It's got admiration of God's beauty. It's got some embracing and some kissing and some poetry and commitment and settle down. Okay, <laughs> just, just. I want you to know, uh, a lot of years ago, Bev and I had a privilege of, uh, there's a couple that we just kind of have been mentoring for a, a lot of years. I absolutely uh, love Eric and Rose. Um, and uh, we've, they got engaged, and I said, hey, I said, we're going to give you guys a wonderful uh, wedding present. We're, we're going to take you guys to go see Phantom of the Opera. And uh, so we took them out to dinner, Phantom of the Opera. We went out to dinner, and we went to watch this, this, this play. I didn't know anything about the play. Nothing. I still don't really know anything about the play. Okay? Um, but I want. But but I, I wrote these things down because because the, what I'm going to describe to you is this is the truth. Okay, the the, the 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 play is over. Okay, the play is over, and and I look over and Rose is crying. I go, I go, Rose, you okay? And she goes, Have I ever told this story here before? I, I said, Rose, what are you crying about? She goes, Such is like one of the greatest plays you've ever seen you're laughing rose man there was fog coming man there was an intense music that dancing choreography was awesome we're sitting on the floor our, our, our eyes are right on the floor we could actually see the trap door that comes up when the guy disappeared the chandelier comes down i reached my hand up i tried to touch it i'm going through all these things i, go, I said rose it was i'm coming to see it again and she goes do you even know what this is about I said, I don't know, but I'm coming again. And she goes, no, John. <laughs> now she's crying because I'm not crying. And I said, Rose, what's the matter? She goes, John, do you even understand the main theme of this thing? And I go, uh, I think some girl liked the ghost. Um, <laughs> And then she couldn't make up her mind between loving this ghost and loving this guy. And I, th I think that's what I said. Is it about love? And she goes, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going, I don't know, but I'm coming to watch it again. <laughs> I missed the point. All the things that were making love attractive, I captured. But I didn't capture the theme of love. Um, the truth is, is that uh, the Song of Solomon is, is, is a book that uh, many pastors don't want to touch. Many, uh, many uh, parents don't want their kids reading. And it's probably, probably a lot of that, as I said, is because we live in the, in, in the Western world. It's one of the most read books of all times. The very first words of the book say, Solomon's Song of Love, Song of Songs. It's a song. It's a play. I'm going to do my best to describe to you the book, basically, okay? And uh, then and then, going to take away some, some lessons from it. Here's the basic story of the, of, of, of the book. There's this woman, and she's out admiring the, the field workers. And there's this guy who happens to be a king who's dressed like one of the field workers. And she admires him, and he admires her, and this is... I don't, we don't know how long of a time period this is, but just great admiration. The admiration is somewhat because of what they look like, and the admiration is somewhat because of the way they carry themselves. Well, a little bit of time passes, and all of a sudden, this, this girl meets the king. She doesn't realize 
the king looks familiar to her, but she's not putting it all together. And she realizes, that's the field worker guy. I'm in love with the king. And the king is in love with me. And then it moves into these three little stages of, of, of the story. And the story is, it's a story of their, what I would call their courtship. Literally getting to know one another. There's already, a, there's already attraction for the eyes. But what about the attraction of the heart to the heart? What about the attraction of the mind to the mind? And then there's a betrothal time. And then there's a marriage time. And there's a little bit of trouble in the end. They come back together. That's really the story. It's a musical. If, if I were to give you one little tip, uh, it would be this. Every time if you read the book and you hear the word, my love, the guy is talking to her. It, it's easy to get lost sometimes. You know, you ever been, a, anybody ever been in a drama or a play or something and it's got your name and then what you say? Okay. Well, the, the phrase, my beloved, is, is that, that is her starting to talk to him. So if you ever read the book and you go, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lost, if you'll keep those two things in mind, every time the words come out that say, my love, it's him talking. And every time it says, my beloved, it's her talking. And the book will make a whole lot more sense than ever before. There's beautiful songs. There's compliments in there. He actually refers to her as... Um, as uh, Shulamite, I think is probably how you pronounce it. And it's really saying, hey, Mrs. Solomon. He, 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 he is passionate about this person. And, and like many of you who have, a, who have a spouse, some of it started because of the eyes. Something just gazed and you thought. <sighs> <laughs> but you know what? Um, that's, not the, that's not the basis of a lifelong commitment. It's, uh, it's clear that there's uh, some passion in this book, and I think that there are several great lessons. I don't know how many of them will make it through here, but, but uh, that's the story, and here's the lessons. One of the lessons is this. God's banner over you and God's banner over me is love. If God had a, a sandwich board and he was wearing it around, it'd say this, I love you. Bob, I love you. Keith, I love you. Doug, I love you. Bev, I love you. Christy, I love you. Ann, I love you. He would be declaring it loud and strong, and he did. Jesus Christ did upon the cross. And, and, and Solomon is declaring in, in Solomon 2, 4, he says, let him lead me to the banqueting hall and let his banner over me be love. Let it be known that you were invited to my table and you are my sweetheart here. You know, God thinks of you as one of his sweethearts. You know, God's got your picture on his fridge. He does. This is, this is love that says, come here. You are safe in my arms. It's the representation of, of uh, being safe in my presence. Even though we fall short, his banner over us is love. Even though we aren't perfect, his banner over us is love. Sometimes in our arrogance, he says, you're a fool, but my banner over you is love. He wants us to know that we are loved and cherished above all else in all the world. There is no doubt that his banner over us is simply saying, I love you and I adore you. That's important. How many of you guys have ever heard this phrase before? For better or for worse. Well, then why don't we accept the worst and try to make it better? It's like, it's for better and if I feel like it is what a lot of people are really saying. But his banner over you is love. S Solomon's banner over her was love. And God's banner over you and I is love. It's incredible, incredible thought. Here's a second thought. Courtship is important. Way too many relationships advance quickly into the physical area of life. And once benefits are enjoyed, it's really hard to walk away from that. It's literally, they get in the way of what I call real growth. Going into a marriage, going into any type of lasting relationship, I don't care if it's a business transaction, 
You know what? Courtship is important. Courtship is simply saying this. There's two sets of personalities here. And there's two sets of strengths, and there's two sets of weaknesses, and we are going to accept those weaknesses, and we're going to accept those strengths in the other person, and we're not going to let the physicality of life get in our way of loving and adoring the other person. Courtship is important because it's basically saying this. The thing I'm most interested in right now is knowing who you are. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to win you. I'm trying to convince you that I love you and I want to know who that is that I love. The number of business transactions in the world that are made because of what the dollar signs say rather than the commitment to one another is absolutely terrible. If I went into business with somebody, I'd want them to know this. Hey, we're going to be giving to all kinds of things in the community. Let's just get used to it. When somebody comes here and says, will you buy a couple of tickets, the answer is going to be yes the vast majority of the time unless it's something I don't believe in. If it's something against scripture, no way. But hey, we're going to be givers. When, when, when Bev and I chose to get married, one of, the, one of the principles of our life was we're not giving 10% of our income to God. It started at 15. Went to 30. It's 45 now. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying, we got to get used to that. I think I would disappoint her if I said, hey, Bev, let's just start giving 11%, okay? Let's just be a little bit better than what the Bible requires. You see, courtship made security of all of that. In the business world, courting is often about wooing rather than really caring about that other person. Courtship simply says this. It's concentrating on deepening the understanding of one another. It's not about benefits. Courtship is vital in our relationship world. It amazes me how many people jump into moving in together. You know what? If they're not a believer, I really don't care because until you're, and, and, until you're falling in love with who Jesus Christ is, a lot of stuff just doesn't matter because until you've reached a point of saying to God Almighty, oh, I need you more than anything in all the world, a lot of things just don't make any sense. They just don't matter. God's banner over you is love and courtship is very important. Here's the third one. Honeymoons are great and marriage is supposed to be also. Let me say that again. Honeymoons are supposed to be great, and so is the marriage afterwards. In case you didn't know, there's a Monday after the honeymoon. <laughs> That's when the first set of dirty laundry hits the ground. That's when clothing just starts falling off the guy on the way inside the door. A coat there, a pair of shoes there, a sock there. That's when the first spill happens in the kitchen. It's when the guy grabs that water bottle out of the fridge and drinks it and there's breadcrumbs in it. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? That's why you use a, that's why you use a solid bo- bottle color, not a clear one, okay? <laughs> Just want to go on record with that. You know, many people focus, focus excessive amounts of money on weddings, a wedding reception and a honeymoon. When a couple says to me, uh, hey, hey, we're wondering if you'll do our wedding. And I said, I was wondering if you'll do the rest of your life together and, and we, we can spend six sessions together. And what I'm going to tell you is not a joke. This is the absolute truth. If a couple came to me today, Harry, if you get engaged this week, okay. Um, <laughs> if they come to me, this is why I tell them. I say, I've been looking to meet with you for six times. I said, you don't ever owe me any money. Not, I, I don't even want anything. But I'm going to tell you the truth. We're going to meet six times, and if you ever show up here without having done what I asked, it'll cost you $1,000 for the wedding. And if you do it a second time, it'll be $2,000 for the wedding. And they look at me, and they go, why? I said, you're spending, if you're like any other American buddy person getting married, you're spending thirty-four dollars to $35,000 on a wedding. You're spending $4,000 on a wedding ring. You're spending $4,900 on a um, on a honeymoon, and you're not going to invest on the Monday when you return? 
quite frankly, you're, you're, you're faking yourself out. There is, there is a Monday that takes place. I once offered a young man a thousand dollars to back out of his wedding, and he took it. That bride was not very happy with me. That father-in-law was not very that future. He, he was he was he was mad. But if you interview that guy right now, this is what he'd tell you. Because two years later, his daughter got married, and he came to me and said, "Did you give that guy the money?" I said, "No, he wouldn't take it." He says, you keep offering that to people, and if anybody ever takes it, you just tell them, you, you just give me their name. He says, because I'll write a check. He goes, because I praise God he backed out. You know, it's an incredible thing. Weddings are incredible. The, the amount of time that goes into colors and timing and space and music and balancing guest lists and proper seating of family members, it's amazing the amount of lavishness that goes in to this to this. 20-minute ceremony and this three-and-a-half to four-hour reception, but getting ready for Monday afterwards doesn't happen. I, I, I said to Bev a couple of months ago, I said, Bev, I said, next, I, I said, from now until we stop being pastor, I being pastor here at the church, says, every couple that gets married, I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them a wedding gift that is to a marriage conference the first year they're married. I'm just going to ask a couple of people to chip in because I want them to start making investments so that they'll be better for the next year than they are right now. You see, marriage is about growing together. It's about serving together. It's about making memories of impact on other people. It's about growing closer to God, and it's about being more of a, in the man's case, it's about being more of a man of God next year than it is right now, and it's about the woman being more of a woman of God a year from now so that you have something to give to make things even more better, more better, that's a lousy phrase, more better than ever before. Actually, I wrote that way in my notes here. If you're looking for something, I just want you to know, a place called Hume Lake Christian Camps has incredible couples conferences. Mount Hermon has incredible couples conferences. There's a fabulous organization called uh, Family Life Today, and they do a thing called Weekend to Remember. Weekend to Remember is not some major romantic thing. It's about building lives of a husband and building lives of a wife. One of the greatest gifts that you as a parent maybe a grandparent could give to your grandkids or to your kids, send them away for a weekend and let them get some spiritual input. Let them get some time away. Here's a fourth point, okay? Speak positively about your spouse. Do you know that the uh, currently 2.5 versus 1 is the amount of negative communication that a spouse receives? For every one comment of positive things, there's 2.5 bad things that are said. Well, that kind of sets a great tone for marriage, doesn't it? Kind of sets a great tone for relationship. We should never stop dating our spouse. We should never stop uh, making positive comments to them. It causes an attraction, and it doesn't push our spouse away. It lets others know where the commitment is. It's a way of putting that banner of love over your spouse. Do you know that uh, our speech to our spouse is almost always self-fulfilling prophecy? Some of you out here, you're thinking, man, I'm not married. You know what? You have family members that are married. I hope you pass some of these thoughts on to them. What do I mean by self-fulfilling prophecy? If we speak words of affirmation, that's who they're going to want to be, and they're going to want to stay on that track, and it's going to cause them to want to act and be a certain way. Whereas if all we're doing is giving correction, what they're saying is I'm not good enough and they're going to look elsewhere to be good enough. They're going to be looking, they're going to be looking for the place that doesn't completely overlook all of their faults, but at least they're complimenting that which is good. Here's a, here's a fifth thought. This is out of Solomon 2.15. Let me read the verse to you and then I'll give you the little thought. Catch the foxes. The little foxes that ruin the vineyards, the vineyards that are in bloom. Here's the fifth point. Get rid of the foxes. Here's what that, here's what that verse is talking about. As some of the, 
some of the vineyards would come into bloom, the foxes would run through and their tail would knock some of the blossoms off. It would knock the things off and it would ruin that. It doesn't matter if it's a little fox or a big fox. The point is that foxes were so plentiful in this area of the world that it just destroyed all these blossoming vineyards. And that if we don't nip those things in the bud, anybody, anybody like, like the Andy Griffith show? There's a guy on that show, his name's Barney Fife. That dude cracks me up, man. One of Barney's favorite lines in the ever, nip it in the bud, nip it, nip it, nip it. Puts his hand in his, nip it in the bud. And then he shakes his head a little bit, and, and he, he, he's an expert on the phrase, but he's terrible at the action. You know what I mean? Uh, he, he's hilarious. And the idea is this, is that we need to prevent the fox from arriving. And when the fox does arrive, we need to get rid of it. We need to scare the fox away. And if the fox continues to come back, we need to shoot the fox. Just being honest, okay? Get a fox license. The problem with foxes are they're crafty. They're deceitful. They're about destruction. And the vast majority of the destruction that they do is not intentional. It's the fact that that's the way they carry their tails. There's this thought of stumbling blocks. And one of the greatest stumbling blocks in every relationship in the world is a simple phrase that says, it's not that bad. So how bad does something have to be to be bad? I'm, I'm, I'm serious. How bad does something have to be to be bad? No, it's, it, it's like somebody saying to somebody, you know, they're, they're um, you know, it's like the kid who says to his mom and dad, he says, you know, hey, it's, um, um, it, it, mom, my allowance isn't about the money, but I was wondering if I could have more. No, as soon as you said the phrase about the money, it, it is. It's about the money. You, you can't say that phrase and then say it's not. A, it, it doesn't work that way. That, that, that's, that's wrong thinking. You know, when we say the phrase, it's not that bad, you know what happens? We start thinking about second best. And then before we know it, it's seventh best. And then before we know it, it's ninth best. It's a phrase of defeat. Let me share one more. Complimenting should never stop. Complimenting should never stop. I'm going to give you some ideas for how to compliment someone else. Maybe it's about their work ethic. Maybe it's about their decision making. Maybe it's about their parenting. Maybe it's about their love for other people. Maybe it's about their service. Maybe it's about their spiritual wisdom, about their character, about their consistency, about their heart and attitude. If you look up at the screen there, some men in the Midwest, this is true, okay? They say this is about 60% of the men in the Midwest. On the day I got married, I said, I love you, and nothing's changed since then. pretty shameful. I haven't changed my mind, so I don't need to tell you that I changed my mind. The absence of compliments leave a sense of you aren't really that important to me in the first place. The, uh, the book of Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, whichever you want to call it, it's got incredible insights into just general relationships. In this case, in this case, it was uh, meant about marriage. Um, some people ask this question, so I just thought I would address it a little bit to say, hey, is, 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 it, is this a book about a real man and woman? Or is this really just an allegory about Christ and the church? Yes. It has to be about both. And the reason why it has to be about both is because in the book of Ephesians, we learn this that we are the bride of Christ and he adores us and he compliments us and he gifts us and he gives us talents and strengths and we should find absolute great admiration in giving back to him by serving those things. It is both. 